Okay, thank you everybody for being here. Um, good afternoon, good morning. On behalf of the explorers of the International Federation for Public History, I welcome everybody who is here. My name is Jimena Perry. I am the project manager for Explorers, and today we are very happy and delighted to have two very special guests who will talk about their project, Use and Reuse of Digital Historical Newspapers, the new site project in practice. We have with us Eva Fanselter, who is an associate professor and the deputy head of the Institute of Contemporary History, as well as the deputy head of the Research Center for Digital Humanities at the University of Innsbruck in Austria. Her fields of teaching and research include European and regional contemporary history, Holocaust studies, memory and politi politics of memory, migration, and digital humanities. She has published widely about Holocaust history and memory and its digital implications. Her current book called, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I just, I, I'm, I'm reading the German and I don't know German, so. so. Her current book called the Digital Holocaust, Very Viral Negotiations of the Genocide Between Public History, Politics of Memory and Commerce, appeared uh, published in spring of 2021. If you are interested uh, in more information about her book, I can put the link in the chat. And we also have with us Sarah Obelbickler, Obelbickler, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Contemporary History at the University of Innsbruck, Austria. She received her PhD in contemporary history in Innsbruck in 2019, and is currently working on projects for the analysis and visualization of digital newspapers and digital archives. Her research interests are European and regional contemporary history, migration history, media and discourse, and digital humanities. Her current book, Autochthonous Minorities and Migrants, Media Argumentation Strategies from 1990 to 2015, using the example of South Tyrol was published in December, 2020. <clears throat> I will please ask the audience to keep their mics mute during the presentation and talks of our presenters. And if you have comments or questions, you can please use the, you can please use the chat. When the time comes, I will read your questions and comments to our presenters. And thank you for being here again, Evan, Sarah, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Jimena. Thank you for having us here. Um, Thank you. Yes, Jimena, could you please share uh, the slides as we agreed before? Uh, Sarah and I agreed on more or less um, having common slides and we will just introduce you briefly to our uh, project that is actually in the, in the, in the fine, in its final phase. It's a U European Horizon 2020 project. And we've been working together here with colleagues from libraries, also from computer science departments, trying to investigate uh, the historical, digital historical collections more deeply. Um, Jimena, please second the second slide. Oh. I'm sure you're all aware, or most of you are aware, most of you who work with uh, historical material are aware that we have a lot of newspaper interfaces, digital newspaper interfaces that we can access, where we can access uh, digi digitized material um, over libraries, over collection hosts and so on. Um, so mostly we have newspaper collections that come from libraries here, of course, uh, all of you probably know Trove, the, the Australian portal, or also um, the one from the Library of Congress. Um, where we have huge collections of digitized historical newspaper material that we can access and look into. Uh, in the NewSci project, we've been working mainly with three uh, libraries. So that's the National Library of Finland with, um, with their two portals. Um, one is for professional uh, users, so to say. Um, they are called Digia Corp, uh, and one is for general public. Then we have been working with uh, the one here that you can see here in the, on the left hand side with Anno, that's the newspaper access page interface from the Austrian National Library in Vienna. And also, of course, we have been working with um, the National Library of um, France, um, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France.
France with uh, their newspaper portals or their um, front pages, so to say, where we can access historical material. Here is one on the right hand side, Gallica. Um, now, before I go into the details of the next page, please, Jimena. So what have we been doing the new side project? We have done ma mainly a, a couple of things as a digital humanities group. So as people come in, coming from the humanities uh, and working together with colleagues from the National Library and with colleagues from the, uh, from the computer science departments. So our, one of our main tasks uh, was, tasks were to find out if the tools and methods that were generated by our colleagues and offered via the user interfaces uh, do actually help us as humanities uh, researchers to find information that we need to use and reuse that information in an easy way, so to say, for someone who is not very highly experienced with computational um, tools and so on. So that was our main purpose was, so to say, to find out if we can ask our humanities research questions and dig into the material that is available on the user interface and on a uh, um, yeah, interface that actually was created uh, by our team. Uh, in order to do this, we have actually asked some specific questions. So we have used case studies um, where we tried to find out if we find those answers. And those case studies were mainly about migration, history, about uh, gender questions, about war and uh, revolts and, yeah, so to say, upheavals in history. Um, and our fourth question was, of course, media history. So digging into journalism and questions that relate to all issues of media history. The time period of, of the material that we, uh, that we tried to cover with the material we had where it was between 1850 and more or less 1950, although there we already have a lot of copyright restrictions um, because in Europe, usually you can access material that is older than a hundred years. In Austria, we have this special uh, permission to have material that is but it is older than 70 years. So basically we are for now restricted to this really, let's say, yeah, to the past, to past material. Um, and we still have to find ways to work with younger material. Um, what did we do in the project? We, as Digital Mantis Group, we tried, so we did these things. So we made some, yeah, very academic um, approaches to the case studies, but also we try to use our project results for general public. So that means we have we created a lot of material on our website uh, that you can access, starting from blog posts to uh, yeah Twitter threads to case study descriptions to YouTube videos to on, on how to use the platform and so on and so on. And we also showcase some of the case studies um, on the website. Uh, last but not least, we created a, a whole set of education material for different kinds of use um, for teachers, pupils, for lay historians, uh, both, mostly for secondary school, but also for university teaching. Also here, I would like to invite you to just go to our homepage, which is actually very easily accessed. And I just realized now that we didn't put the link in there. It's newsi.eu. Um, yes. Um, then I give over to my colleague Sarah and ask Jimena to please open the next slide so that she can dig a little bit into what we were doing. Yeah, um, as Eva already explained, we had like different use cases within the NewsEye project. Um, I was mainly working on the use case uh, migration. And uh, we were working together with computer scientists and trying to figure out um, or to work out how to work with these digitized uh, historic newspapers. And especially we, are try we were trying to find somehow um, of a yeah, digital history workflow. So how to actually work from um, finding um, newspaper clippings or specific newspapers actually to the end of interpreting them and disseminate them. So we were of trying to figure out um, what works um, very well for, for users, but also for us, um, for humanities researchers, but um, actually all kind of different user groups that would use historical um, 
newspapers and um, how we can actually support those user groups. So we are talking about humanity researchers, but we are also just talking about um, students or other interested people, librarians, um, lay historians and so on. And um, yeah, all different user groups have a different access to the material, of course, but we were trying to figure out what could be like a good, good workflow um, through these newspapers. So of course, like there need to, needs to be like a good user interface, or it's good to start with a good um, interface. In the news site project, we called it the demonstrator. Um, which actually we developed um, as a showcase. Um, we had like um, 1.5 million newspaper pages on the demonstrator and I tried, uh, as the name says, <laughs> to demonstrate how actually this interface uh, can work to, to figure out or to find uh, newspaper clippings. So um, we are, we are trying to, to actually implement uh, functions for the searching, the finding, the organization of newspaper clippings, for the collecting, collecting, exploring, and exporting newspaper clippings. And then, of course, we were dealing also with um, external tools um, or um, labs, um, because uh, there is actually this kind of point where the interface is not enough anymore, where you actually have collected all the newspaper clippings and maybe created an own collection. But then it comes to the analysis and then it needs to be more individualized. Um, people maybe want to have their own um, methods, their own tools. And uh, that's actually where external tools step in. And um, yeah, we were looking into some of those tools and we also uh, present some of um, these tools here. And um, what was important for us is um, how can we import um, the data sets for, from the user interface there? How can we analyze them and visualize um, them? And just to make this a little bit more concrete on a, concrete on a specific example, um, please for the next slide. So um, this is just like showing um, the, the user um, interface, the demonstrator, some, some parts of it. Um, we actually want to show here um, the more specific um, example. Um, I also have the link here in case you um, actually want to have a look at it. So we were using, uh, or we, want, we were looking into a specific case. It's the refugee discourse in, in historical um, newspapers. And um, we're actually trying to find this, this way how, how we can start with and how actually we could support the start and the search. Um, that's why actually um, the first um, step for us was like finding good keywords, of course, um, to um, get to the refugee discourse. And there we also have um, a tool that is uh, suggesting um, keywords. It's actually working with, with um, a digital method that's called word embedding, which is um, yeah, looking for semantically sim similar words. Um, you can also choose the languages here and just find like words that are similar um, to the word you're looking for. If, if, for example, you're looking for refugees, you, you might find um, related words um, on, on the migration topic and just helps you to find words. Um, we needed to, to, ex to explore the found articles, to have a look into them, to close read. So it was very important for us actually to have like this combination of having um, a distance look but also a closed look with is within the interface um, and it was also very important to, to save the found articles um, and also to create compound articles um, so to co combine articles if the article separation was not um, very well we were also able to just like merge them together to save them as we needed um, then to organize them and that also explore them within within the um, platform, and of course, which is also very important um, to export the collection. So in the platform, there is uh, we have different um, yeah um, export uh, functions. Uh, we can export it as CSV. Uh, we can export it as JSON, also as um, text, uh, plain text. And these were actually the most important steps for us to going through. Um, also, while um, looking at the refugee refugee discourse, so first we 
we're looking for good um yeah good good keywords and then we were just collecting everything we were saving it we actually were merging articles that were not good enough and then we export exported this collection to further um, work on it and um, now Eva is going to show you um, two external tools which work very well um, with um, yeah, also historic newspapers and how she imported the collection um, we exported actually from the demonstrator how she imported it and how she did some analysis there um, please next slide actually this is one for you Sarah so well, maybe... actually it's still mine yeah but going over to the external tool, um, yeah, I already explained. This is the moment where we want to export now um, our collection and investigate, um, yeah, for example, word frequencies, collocations. We want to create bigram word clouds, or uh, um, train topic modelings, for example, or word embeddings, and so on. And this is, yeah, this is the next step. And Eva will explain now <laughs> two of the tools. Okay, Jimena, please, the next slide. So if uh, we were in a hands-on session, which unfortunately we cannot do at this stage, we would now introduce you to different uh, programs, so to say, or tools that uh, one could use and um, one is, or people using digital data are using. So uh, in our case, we have been working uh, with uh, mainly Orange and Voyant. Um, Orange is a data mining uh, suit, as you can see here, it's free. Um, it helps a lot uh, with, if you're not very familiar with digital tools, it helps a lot because it, it, we'll look at this in, in, in a minute. Uh, it helps a lot to work through the different steps between our humanity humanities um, questions between material and computational part, computational parts. Um, we've had the advantage that, or we will have the advantage that here at the University of Innsbruck, um, Orange is the data mining tool is going to be uh, implemented or incorporated into Cybers. That is a new platform of new. The platform is not new, new but this uh, co-working space, so to say, this digital co-working space is going to be opened for all research, researchers at the University of Innsbruck and um, following our request they will be implementing Orange there so you have the advantage of have your data stored locally in on our service and you don't always have to look for them uh, in the cloud which can be an advantage but in our case since we are working with um, copyrighted material of course it is important that we have this safe space. Um, next slide please. So in orange, um, what is important and what, 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 was, what is easy for us, to, why it is easy for us to use is that orange is already working with newspaper interfaces. So you can access mainly two uh, newspapers, that's the Guardian and New York, the New York Times by applying for an API link from those newspapers. And then you would have the entire material there, but you can also just basically use um, all kinds of um, transcribed data here, your own corpus that you can upload and then use these dig digital methods. Um, this year, just to show you, it's uh, already adapting or, or just is adapting to a lot of uh, computational linguistics use, uh, which can also be adapted for people using newspaper material outside the interfaces. Next slide, please. So here, just to quickly to show you what is the result. If you have this API key, you can then go on to use the paper in this text format here. Um, thank you. Next slide, please. But we are going to work with something even, let's say, easier without any knowledge of, of computational things. We are going to use, uh, or I'll just show you, show you briefly through Voyant, how, you, how we can, how we did actually begin to work with the material that we were able to uh, export from our platform, from the demonstrator. Um, Voyant is a free tool. It, it is um, designed for use of your own material. The only 
yeah, handicap, so to say, is that it cannot host millions of pages, but you're okay as long as it's only thousands of pages or thousands of articles. Um, next slide, please. Then you would just have to uh, upload your material here. I use JSON. You can make some um, yeah, distinguishing um, comments here to have the perfect data in there. But uh, usually you get an error message. So if you use Voyant, just ignore the er error messages and continue with your work because it, because it is going to upload your data anyway. Next slide. And what do we get if we if we um, bring our data into Voyant? Usually, we have all kinds of quantitative statistical material that comes out of it. The most um, most used part probably is the word cloud that we see here in the left-hand corner. You can see the machine is basically just counting um, numbers, counting words in, um, so to say, in a word uh, in a bag of words, and it shows it here with different colors and sizes, so to make um, to to make it vis make visible what is what is the most important words that are being used. What are the most important words that are being used in in this huge um, Material bag of words that you have been um, introducing or that have been up uploading here. Um, next slide, please. Uh, of course, you can clean the data in Boyan. And here, just to show on the left hand side, I took out mo the most important words. Since my corpus was about refugees, I took out all this word, the words related to refugees, because of course they will be in there since I looked for them in the first place. And then I tried to see, so what, what are the most important things that are being, words that are being used here? Of course, it is interesting to see. I mean, uh, I don't know. Yeah, it is an English speaking newspaper. It's the Herald Tribune, so it is not, too surprising, but still, we have the most important words that come up here, that pop up here, you can see on the right hand side is American, the Mr. and Mrs., which of course we probably would have to eliminate since it could be all kinds of names that come up here. But then we have work in Paris, that is a very good indication for me already where I would actually start looking uh, into the material, digging deeper into this material, and see where is the connection here between American work in Paris and why do these work these words pop up so often in the material that I have here. So I could basically as a being a historian I could jump right into this into this uh, into this triangle of words that I find here. Um, Next slide, please. Uh, I, one thing that I always like to use very much is this uh, context tool that we find in Voyant, because I can basically focus on one uh, word. In this case, it was refugees, and look in what context this word appeared. And you can see there is, of course, some indication that this is going, this is about, or the, this, this, the, 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 the newspaper articles are about returning refugees, uh, which is interesting because actually probably I was looking for refugees uh, going away, but they are returning refugees. Um, and we have some, um, I don't know, um, nationalities in there, Armenian, Belgian, Russian. So I can see, uh, okay, the context, this word here is being used um, is uh, rather wide, but also I have some indication what I could look for in uh, my corpus. Basically, I would make, probably use for uh, use this returning idea and also the nationalities that are being mentioned here. Uh, so context is one thing that I like very much. One more slide. But also here, as I said before, here the trends that are being uh, selected for the words that I can choose or for the words that are being used in the word cloud, um, I can see how this course has changed or how um, the discussion about specific words change. If we just for visualization purposes pick out the word Mrs. MRS, you could see there is actually quite some change over time, although it's always highly used. We of course would have to go back to the material and find out why is this word even so prominent here in this case. Um, last but not least, the next slide. We also have some 
georeference um, tool in, he in here. Um, so basically this is a visualization where you can see uh, uh, that shows you where the material um, is located, basically what the material is talking about, what um, named entities, place named entities um, are mentioned and how often they are mentioned. And also, in, I mean, this is a, like a visualization that moves over time. So you could basically see where this news travel from if, if we have the right parameters. So basically, how are these uh, place names talked about in, in what time frame? And lastly, Jimena, one more. Of course, there are some experimental tools in here that work with topics. Um, that is, the machine is then trying, uh, so the tool here is trying to find out if I put together all the most used terms, which ones would indicate what kind of topics this is being talked about. And let's, I don't know, uh, of course, um, not all topics make sense, especially not to the human eye, but we could, of course, find also some topics in here. Um, for example, French Paris Day, uh, war, wounded gift, a cold winter. So the second topic here could have something to do with, uh, with a cold winter and in France and in Paris and so on. Or the fourth could have something to do, could be a specific, a smaller corpus within my whole collection talking about German. Um, German related things and so on and so on. Um, topic modeling, of course, is um, very challenging. It depends on many things. And this is why usually these outside tools, these automated outside tools, um, at least that's what we found are not enough for what we need them because also we have a hard time understanding um, what happens and at this point, I give over to Sarah again, and she will just continue working on this topic issue um, and maybe show a couple of things that we did then with basic programming skills. Yeah, next slide, please. So, yes, um, I was actually using um, Jupyter Notebooks and um, Python packages. So um, Jupyter Note Notebook is nothing else than a uh, um, coding environment, which is pretty easy to use. You have like this coding environment, like a page, you can use code, but also you can have columns where you just um, explain what you um, are doing. And yeah, so there's... Um, Python packages. So Python is, is a programming languages, and there are some specific packages that allow you to um, run digital methods actually quite easily. You just have to um, adapt them and um, kind of know how, how to read them. And uh, of course, also how, how to debug <laughs> some mistakes that can happen. And of course, also know how to import um, your collection into, into those Jupyter notebooks. But then you can actually use those um, those packages. You can see here in, in these pictures. Um, so you, I use the Gansim package, um, which is a very typical package for topic modeling, or also the NLD key back package, which which is very helpful for creating um, biograms, trigrams, um, and just doing some some word analysis. And with this package, um, you can import them into your um, notebooks, basically, or coding environment. Jupyter Notebook is just uh, one example of it. You can, can use any coding environment. They are just very handy to use. And actually, if you share them, um, they can be reused by other people, which is very handy as well. So basically, I was importing um, a collection we created uh, on, on the refugee discourse as we were talking before, um, here you can see on, on the right, you can see I had a collection uh, between 1914 to 1920. So this is basically the war time and uh, the two years after the war. And here you can also see the amount of um, newspaper clippings that um, are in this collection. And um, yeah, we were uh, so um, looking for um, refugees. We were, of course, finding um, newspaper clippings in the English speaking newspaper we had in the demo demonstrator, which was the New York Herald. And um, so having this uh, collection um, in the uh, in my coding environment, I was um, trying or uh, trying just different uh, digital methods um, on it. And actually uh, also uh, was able to 
find some um, interesting discourse markers, I will call them, just like hints that show me where I can find the interesting discourses and where I can investigate further on this topic. Um, next slide, please. So the first thing that I did was creating Bigram uh, word clouds. Um, it's basically word clouds, but that show um, typical words that occur together um, frequently. They, it shows those words together. Just for example, the United States, you can read it now, United States, because um, they are basically um, yeah, just shortened to um, unite them kind of um, to make it better readable. Um, so they are stamped, you would, would, you would say it like that, this. So just all these words, they um, actually appear next to each other. And this is also very interesting because you, you get a little bit more of the context of um, one word. And I, what I was trying is just like to create this biogram um, word clouds for different years. So I told you I had like time frame from 1914 to 1920. So first I was looking in the 1914 corpus I had, um, which was like one of the smaller ones. But you can actually see here just from the from the biograms that it was actually the discourse was mainly war um, related. So it, it's um, many words that, that are related. You can relate to the war time, the starting of the war, the soldiers, but then also the German cruiser, uh, um, and um, yeah, also a little bit costs we have here, but mainly, um, yeah, ma mainly um, war related. But then if, if we go to the 1917 discourse, so it's um, already like the year before the end, the war ends and the, the discourse on refugees um, changed a lot, as you can see here, here um, already. It mainly talks about donations, about help, ab about information, um, um, list of donations, appears. So um, you can, it's just like very different than the discourse before. So basically here we have now a lot of discourses on how to help those peoples, why first the discourse mainly started about the war and the people had to leave. And this is actually very interesting and would lead me to have a closer look at those discourses and um, how, how, yeah, doing a lot of close reading afterwards. Uh, but going into topics, um, if I was already talking a little bit about topic modeling, um, next slide, please. I was using the Gensim library, which is actually the most used Python library for um, topic modeling, and which is of course um, very nice with this with, with this library that um, you are free to do um, many things. Of course, you can change any parameter. You can you decide how many topics you want to train. Um, you can decide how big the corpus is you want to train on, and then there's other parameters you can just choose. So you can choose between a uh, word count, but also the importance of words, which is um, still giving some, some further hints. So actually it's, um, yeah, you, you can just like use all the parameters exactly as um, you need it and actually as it is necessary for this specific collection. Because what is very difficult with topic modeling is that each collection is different and each collection basically would need different parameters. Um, and with writing made um, programs, sometimes this is difficult because firstly, you need to understand what these parameters are about and how to choose them and what, what makes them different and, and so on. So um, using this package actually, actually gives you a lot of freedom um, to um, rerun this tool as long as you feel like um, you get quite good topics and you actually can, yeah, you can use them. And what is also very important if you actually rerun um, the, the tool that you actually get topics that are kind of stable. Um, topic modeling is stochastic, so it, it actually changes every time a little bit. Um, so topic, topic modeling will never give you like exact the same results when you redo it. But once you get like topics that are kind of stable, which uh, yeah, do not change too much, this is a very good hint that you actually trained good models and that your parameters are 
working um, quite well. So this is just to show you like one of the one of the um, topics I got, which was topic three. I was training ten of them in total, and um, this is basically more or less about like the help and information um, topic for refugees, a bit similar than we had before already in the word cloud also but you can see it's about eight it's about a beers um and um so it's 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 basically just covering this kind of um yeah um this course on on this um, helping and giving information giving money we also have the word money here for families clothing um so um friends um including all kind of those words. Um, the next slide, please. So this is um, a topic that I would actually interpret as um, att attacks and fires um, leading to the flight of people. So here um, we have a quite different discourse than before. It's talking about fires, it's talking about attacks, it's talking about Germany, it's talking about American in, in the night having the attacks, the, sh the soldiers reports, also giving some places where, where those um, attacks and fires um, took place. So basically, this discourse is, is very much about, um, yeah, uh, these very specific um, refugees that were fleeing because of um, attacks and, and fires. And um, you can also see here that not always like the most frequent words are the most important words. So um, sometimes that, that can vary a lot too. And the last uh, topic I want to show you, um, the next slide, please is um, the topic five, which um, I would um, yeah, interpret as, the, as a discourse on the return of refugees to their country of origin. So of course we have like refugees fleeing, um, but we also have refugees returning, especially, um, I mean, even during the war, but especially also after the word, so, uh, war. So we have like the word return here as, the, as uh, not the most frequent one, but um, as the most important um, word in this um, topic and then followed by um, the, yeah, words that typically also um, yeah, come along with the return uh, migration discourse. And um, next slide, please. Yeah, th this was it about, and I would just say thank you for your interest. <laughs> and we are looking for, um, forward to your questions, of course. Almost, almost, Sarah. <laughs> just give me one minute. Oh, so sure. coming, <laughs> coming back to our original intention, so to say, what was this all about? So why are we doing all this tricky analysis, also computational analysis with material um, as we suggested, or as we actually came here uh, um, to use and reuse digital historic newspaper corpora, um, we were trying to find ways to for the public, public use of newspaper corpora uh, and to improve access uh, for everybody to use this material. Because we have several, um, bigger issues, so to say, with this um, material that we see online. One of that is that most um, most of the times, not always, but most of the times, these collections are um, still very prone to errors due, due to very difficult um, material, that the, the difficult material we have. So that means we have OCR errors, that the text is not a text. It can be that the text is only a scramble of letters and, word and, uh, and uh, numbers and something like that. Um, so um, usually if you have a user coming to these collections, uh, you, he will just basically start with using keywords and get some results. And we found out in our project in USI that oftentimes these results are skewed, are wrong, are somehow misleading, with, uh, with, which has to do with a lot of, of issues like the OCR error uh, rate and also with, uh, with the problem that we do not have a proper article, so to say. So 
uh, after doing all this, uh, uh, this, this stuff with improving uh, the quality of the material and also with uh, computational methods, trying to basically corner <laughs> the material that we have in our demonstrator, uh, we have been trying or we have been trying to show our colleagues from the computer science and uh, from the library sciences um, what it is that we would actually need in order to be able to dig deeper into the material and also to give improvement, uh, to give a hint to, to everybody using uh, the material there. So it's a two-sided project, so to say. On the one hand, trying to improve the quality of the material. On the other hand, trying to improve uh, access um, or to give ideas on how to improve uh, the, the user interfaces so that they are also yeah, they also produce valuable and correct results for the general public. Yeah, and with that, I think we would stop at this point and ask for your questions and comments. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I stop sharing the screen? Yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was really, really interesting. So now I open the, the floor for questions or comments. If somebody wants to just jump in and, and make a, a question. Uh, actually, I have a question. Um, I am not an expert in digital humanities, uh, but um, for what you show us about Voyant and, and Orange, I, I know a little bit about Voyant, but not Orange, but it, it seems to me that there's a lot of work before actually putting the material in the software, like the preparation of your corpus has to be done very carefully to obtain certain results. Uh, um, Eva, the things that you were mentioning before about misleading results or something like that would have to be with the way you prepare your corpus to upload. And is, is, that, is that the case? How is there a good way to prepare a corpus or it just depends on the question you have? Uh, it depends. Um, yes, it has to do with the quality of your material, the material that you upload. Uh, so the cleaner the material is, or the more effort you put into correcting text, into uh, correcting headers and footers and dates and names and so on, the better results you will get. Um, on the other hand, if you have a lot of material and you use expert tools like Orange or others, or the, the things that Sarah showed us, meaning like millions of pages, then the errors become less important. Still, you would you need um, you need you need systems that are able to process that amount of, of, of material. So when we use it, when we use digital material like historical digital material. Um, in the end, you just have to say, well, I put this effort into making a nice corpus that gives me results that I need to be given. Um, when we started in our project, for example, let me just, just tell you about one thing we had, uh, and it was a study that Sarah actually did. Um, we couldn't find, um, we couldn't find any refugees in the material that we had in the German speaking material we had in the 30s and 40s. And we tried to find out what the problem was. And in the end, we found out that we, not even the word national socialism uh, could be found in the material, which was a good indication for us to say, well, there's something wrong with the material. It cannot be that in the 1930s, we do not have national socialism in German speaking newspapers. So after doing a lot of work and putting a lot of effort into finding the, the, the mistake, the error, we found out that the material was so bad, the, the word recognition, the text recognition was so bad that there were actually no words to be found. After that, the material was improved uh, by through processing for our demonstrator and so on. And then of course we had these discourses, courses that we, uh, we could find, that we were looking for uh, both, both uh, migration related and also national socialism related. But still this means um, if you use the, the tools, uh, you should really be aware of having to put quite a lot of time actually into preparing your data. So it's always, it always remains a question, how much effort are you prepared to, 
to put into your original data or would you not rather just start with, with doing your manual labor before you go into these, um, into these tools? Um, we have also experimented with post-OCR correction, it's called, so basically to use the skewed material, the wrong material we have on the interfaces and correcting them by computational uh, algorithms. Uh, it's been quite good, but still for historical material, not good enough. So I would say we cannot yet, we are not yet at the point where we can say just download from historical interfaces, upload to whatever kind of tool you have and get your perfect visualizations and results. So uh, also you work, um... You work in in German, or you work with other languages? I mean, then you have to do also translation. You have to translate things to other languages, and that also can be an issue, right? That's actually a very big issue. That's a big issue. We have been trying to do multilingual topic modeling, for example. We've been trying to put our three uh, national uh, corpora together and find common topics by doing all kinds of computational things there, but that was very tricky. It was actually too tricky. We couldn't get really good results yet, um, which is, which of course it would be interesting to say, hey, what are the overlapping issues here in these three languages, the four languages that we had, that's French, German, and Finnish. Um, the English um, is, English so far is the best um, Corpus, so to the best language that we have so far, because of course there's been a lot of effort put into English language, uh, yeah, whatever topics, topic modeling, and so on. Um, what we had to go back to, so to say, is if we compared languages, uh, we had to go back to named entities, meaning to places, to person names, to specific dates. Uh, that we could investigate. Of course, it would have been nice if we could have been able to just say, tell the machine, tell the tool, well, give us uh, the discourses that we have about World War I in these three languages. But um, we were not so successful yet with that. I mean, there is some, quite some interesting output, but not so good. It is not so good that we could say, well, just use it now. We have a, a question from uh, Biljana. I hope I I just wanted. Oh, I'm sorry. No, sorry. Uh, I would just wanted to ask uh, to add something like for the preparation question you had. Um, just that my my own experience showed that the preparation of data takes longer time than the analysis of data. So normally it take longer, um, uh, spend more time for preparation, which is actually a more important, like more complicated part because you have to find. Some yeah, if there is there something wrong in the data, you have to figure out what it is. You have to find some bugs, some mistakes, and um, just to clean the data and everything. It just takes takes a long time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, I have that feeling because sometimes we just see the results and we think that's just very straightforward, and it seems like there's a lot of work before that. So, <laughs> thank you. We have a, a question from Bil Biljana Sumonovic. Um, I hope I'm saying your name right. She's asking, is it possible to apply the tools mentioned if the newspapers are not in English or German, etc.? Like, Yes, uh, of course. The, the, the tools, usually they, they don't care about the language. It's just, for them, it's just a collection of, of numbers and, 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 and letters and whatever. However, since you have to clean the data or you should clean the data, meaning that you have to remove stop words like full stops or and and the, and that in every language, you at least would need some kind of stop word list, which actually exists for ver very many languages. Uh, and you'd have to add that manually to, or just to import that to the tool so that you have a more or less clean data. But otherwise, there is no restriction in language wise. Thank you. Do we have more questions? I, I have another, well, I'm sorry, I'm talking too much. You can interrupt me, the public, whenever you want. Um, I'm thinking because I am from South America, but we are having a lot of issues with immigration and those kinds of topics, that these kinds of tools and analysis that you make could be also like be really useful to understand like in a big picture, like flows and movements of people and stuff. It's, it's not a question, it's something that I'm 
that I'm thinking about and that I was thinking like, it could be like a, in the future, I mean, like a good way to compare like trends in the, in the world and movements and stuff, since we are having a crisis here at the United States at the border with all the asylum seekers that are coming from Latin America, that it's becoming like a real delicate and problematic issue. So uh, yeah, I think this could be a tool that could give like more lights and comparisons. I think it's, I think it's very interesting. I think it's very, it, if for someone like me, that's a newcomer to the digital humanities scene, how would you advise to start with a program like Voyant or, or there are more simpler tools? Sarah, go ahead. Okay. Um, of course, starting with the simpler, with the simpler, simpler tools, um, because there's one thing of applying those tools, and another thing is to understanding those tools, um, what they are doing, what the algorithm is doing. So the the easier the the algorithm you are using and then the tool that you're using, the, the better you can actually understand. So um, I would always recommend to, to start like with frequencies, understanding what does it mean if something is very frequent, the words are very frequent, are appearing very frequent or not very frequent. So this is actually uh, quite quite easy to understand. And then when it comes like to more co complicated statistical analysis, um, but uh, yeah, I, I would um, always recommend to use um, tools that already exist and um, like Eva showed, um, Voyeur is of course one of the tools which you can easily use and have like results immediately. This is very nice too, like you can have results very, very fast because it can be very frustrating if you need like a long time to just get some results and this can just make you not uh, liking it anymore or doing it anymore. So. Um, yeah, what, what would you say, Eva? Um, I think with current migration uh, trends, it would be very interesting if we had the results from our study, so to say, where are the discourses in media? Uh, basically, so what is media talking about or where is the connection between society, media and politics and what is being transported on newspapers or on, 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 on media sites? Um, we found that we cannot extract these courses yet, because I think it would be very interesting to see how, how are migrants being portrayed, how they are being talked about. Uh, we have these issues also here in Europe, of course. Um, so how, what influence do media have on the discourses? How does that change over time? Um, I, haven't, I don't know any automa oh yeah, automatism or any, any machine that can do that yet. Um, also, we know that uh, many of the migrant discourses that we have now are on social media and we do not, at least that's my impression, we do not have any tools or methods yet that give us satisfactory answers on how to really trace those discourses. But of course, that would be something very important, not only for, only for us to have as a humanities researchers, it, was, it would, also, would also be something very interesting to see the impact of media discourses on uh, migration movements. And there is one, I only know of one project in Germany, actually a German Indian project. Uh, they are trying to find how um, newspaper or media discourses are really influencing migration movement from New Delhi to uh, Great Britain. But that's just one that I know, and they are trying to analyze social media data, mostly, mostly from Facebook and mostly from Twitter. Um, no results yet, but of course, we don't have uh, these uh, tools yet, I think. So where do we start? We, we do what we did in the beginning. Yeah, we do frequencies. We, do, we create our own corpora. Selecting the data is, is tricky already. Then we do some frequencies and then we do some manual work. So to say, what is this being talked that's been talked about in this article and so on and so on. But then we go up again, back again to this one question. Yeah, how much effort can you actually really put into creating your perfect corpus? Right? Is there 
Is there uh, an example or a, a case study that you can tell us about, for example, if, if it had happened that you started with a question and then the results show you another thing that you had to like shift your questions? <laughs> Actually, we have, I mean, we have a couple we could of course share, um, but the keywords is, is one of the big issues still. We are using keywords. We always expect the perfect results from keywords and most of the times keywords do not reflect or you have, you have multiple meanings in keywords, yeah? So what you get is can be something totally different uh, like Sarah did a study on return migration, um, but that you could talk about this Sarah. So uh, she got all kinds of return, but not return migration, returning from the mountains, returning from a trip overseas, returning from something, but return migration. So you have, you have, uh, yeah, you get results that have nothing to do with what you're looking for. And actually Sarah could probably easily share some of her work. Yeah, um, like this this main uh, problem with, with keywords when you think that you get some kind of material with specific words, but then it's in the end, it's it's pretty difficult, different what you find in, in the news and there's um, words you haven't thought of and then you will find them or words that um, you have to combine somehow. Uh, um, you actually also, yeah, you, there's this, there's always some, some surprise when you're looking for, um, uh, when you're trying to, to find um, specific topics like, like on, on migration or especially like I did on, on return migration. And um, this is basically, this is very difficult because as I already said, I was trying to find um, newspaper clippings uh, that were talking on about the, those people who are returning um, from um, yeah overseas countries or other countries to their country to, uh, of origin and um, there were just not very much keywords that were leading me to these topics and many many keywords that were leading me to different very different um, return migration mig return migration things mi mi return migration can be a lot it can be bird return migration uh, or animal um, return migration, but also yeah, the kids are returning from the school or even like the water returning um, to, to the sewers. So it, ca it can be just a lot. And it's, it's, this is also one of the main challenges to just deal with when you're working with, with keywords and um, doing full search um, within um, digital newspapers. Uh, but one thing that I also learned that if there is something that actually does not fit at all with your expectation, there is a bug. <laughs> There's something wrong. So every time when I feel like, oh, this is totally unexpected, I found something that is completely um, raw, like completely different to my hypothesis that I had in the beginning after reading literature and everything else. Um, it is mostly a bug, so it's not just like, oh, everything what we did so far is, is, is wrong, and now I found <laughs> something um, completely different and new, um, so like, yeah, if there's something completely, um, so, you, yeah, unexpected, um, it's always good to have a very good, uh, very close look at it. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions do we have from the of the audience comments, queries. I, I actually have another one. I'm, I'm sorry, this, this topic is very, I mean, it's it's fascinating for me, but it's also, I, I don't know very, very, very much about it. You mentioned at the beginning that you design tools for students, for high school students to, for I, I, I guess teachers to use in, in, the, in the classroom. How has that been um, received? Have you had good feedback? Good feedback about those tools? Do, do students like them? If I could ask that. Um, we didn't design tools. We, we created educational material on how oh. to use newspaper uh, material and newspaper interfaces. Um, we just published that in May this year, and actually we've had quite good download rates, especially from teachers um, that were trying to also to find digital material now in during the Corona pandemic to work mm -hmm. with their students. Um, if they had to teach online, of course, that was a good opportunity for us. Uh, we had quite good download numbers. I don't know the actual numbers right now. Uh, 
but we know that it is being used. We had some feedback uh, from uh, one of our teachers here in Austria, and I know in France it has been used also. But I think it it was a good opportunity right now to, um, yeah, since so many people were online and had to work online, also students and teachers uh, had to work online. Of course, I think such um, educational guidelines can help you to really, uh, yeah, move quickly or move more quickly through the material, through the challenges and have some, yeah, very practical help on how to use the material. And thank you, Sarah just shared our the link to our education material in the link in the chat. I don't know, Sarah, if you want to add something. No, um, I, well, I, I don't have any more questions on my end. I don't know uh, if the audience has any more questions or if, or if Sarah and Eva, would you like to make some other comments, remarks, um, observations, something us to be aware of when using this digital uh, tools or any reflection? I don't know, just maybe a closing remark. Uh, public history, this is where we are, the surrounding. Of course, um, this is, I think, the big challenge. Uh, we, on the one hand, we found we underestimate the public, so to say, on how they use the newspaper corpora, the digital newspaper interfaces, because most of the, or many users, let's say it like this, non-professional users are very expert in using the newspapers, but of course they could need some help or not help. They could use some of the tools that we are using to be faster mm -hmm. with their work. Um, on the other hand, we've also found and we are working with, with the National Library of, of, of Austria right now. Um, it is very difficult to combine the two um, fields meaning uh, to combine expert users with somebody who's just browsing historical newspapers. But I think this is actually what we need in the end if we continue working with uh, digital newspaper collections, um, because you will always have a very interested public there, somebody looking for their family history, somebody looking for their town history, whatever, just browsing newspapers from a hundred years ago or something like that. Um, but we had the feeling that it is important to also produce correct, not also, but to make sure that also the, the general public has a correct results and, and gets some grip or has some access to tools that uh, are a little, little bit more sophisticated than just keyboard searches. And that's actually, I think uh, there needs something, we need to investigate more into this, in, into this, into these different user groups. And I think that would be a big thing for public history then to be able to show more from history in that sense. Yeah. Thank you, Eva. Sarah, do you have any final remarks? Yeah, I just maybe wanted to say that, I mean, newspapers are such a rich source. There, is so, there are so many things that you can find in, re, uh, in newspapers, historic newspapers too. And so many like different interests that people have that are looking for different things in, in newspapers. It's like us, uh, people who want to know um, things about a specific topic like migration or nationalism, but it can be just like about a person, as about a specific event, um, maybe um, also about some heritage questions. So it's, it's such a rich source, which becomes available um, even, yeah, even like, more and more available and it's becoming better and better available so um it's, it remains challenging but there has been a lot of great things recently and we hope it's it's continuing of course i think i i think it's continuing i think uh, i have seen a lot of uh, at least some attempts to do projects like you do i think your project is like very solid right now but i think people are starting to to think more about this digital humanities trend, which is it's fascinating, but uh, yeah, it 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 um it it's a lot of work of what I have seen. So I I I I really tip my hat and admire you for doing all this because I can't imagine it's easy nor quick. I think it takes a lot of time. So so thank you. If there's no more questions or comments, uh, I will just thank you on behalf of the International Federation for Public History for 
for accepting this invitation. I, I enjoyed it very, very much. I think it's going to be a, a very nice, um, I mean, I'm sure the reproductions of the video are going to be um, a lot uh, that usually happens and thank you. And I hope we can be in touch and maybe perhaps we can do another event in the future. So glad to do that. Thank you all. Thank you for having us and bye to everyone in that case then. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Amanda, right. <laughs> Amanda, thank, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. It, was, it was a very productive session. I hope you enjoy it, and I will send you the video as soon as it's, it's processed. Thank, thank you, you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.